today we're going to talk about the biggest fear that people have in life. You know, Seinfeld famously joked that um, the person in the coffin isn't scared. It's the person who has to speak about the person in the coffin who is. The fear of public speaking is the number one fear that people have. And I don't even mean necessarily talking on a stage like I do for a living. I'm talking about the fear of speaking in public, sharing your ideas at work, expressing what you need to other people, having hard conversations with friends and family, talking at a meeting at school, uh, pushing back on something uh, with a doctor, like just being able to express yourself. And the reason why this is such a huge fear for people is because it is a moment of intense vulnerability. The second that you go to speak at work, what happens? Everybody turns and all eyes are on you. And suddenly you feel like there's a spotlight on you and you get really worried about being judged. Uh, same thing happens when you have to speak in class, right? When you got called on in class, whoop, most people get a little nervous. A lot of people hated that moment in elementary school when you had to read out loud. That's a moment of public speaking. And we are so afraid in that moment when the spotlight is on us. And I've shared in a number of episodes that I used to be terrified of public speaking. I would turn bright red when I got called on as a little kid. Uh, in law school, I would start coughing attacks or I would leave the room. Uh, as a young uh, lawyer, I would wear a scarf because I'd get these neck rashes as I was talking to the judge and to the prosecutor in a small uh, courtroom. And I just figured I would be the kind of person that always had a bright red face, always had an awful case of hives on my chest, always felt my tongue going dry. And I hated it. I hated it, hated it, hated it. And today what I'm going to talk about is how I went from being afraid of public speaking to becoming, I, I, I'm almost like, you know, like I, 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 it sounds braggadocious, but the truth is I went from that to being the most successful female speaker in the world. More than 111 speeches a year um, on the corporate circuit. So Microsoft, Starbucks, J.P. Morgan, AT&T, any kind of company you can imagine. I've been there. Now, the first question I always get is, how did you get into the speaking business and how did you become the most sought after female speaker on the corporate speaking circuit, Mel? Well, the truth is I didn't set out to do anything. I've told you guys the story about how that TEDx talk happened by accident in 2011 and how I had a 21 minute long panic attack while I was giving that talk and I never thought I would speak ever, ever, ever again. And then something crazy happened. A year later, somebody put the TEDx talk online and for another year, it went crazy viral. And I didn't even know it was online. And so we're talking 2013. Now, by mid-2013, people start to reach out to me on Facebook and say, hey, I saw that thing in San Francisco. And I'm like, were you there? They're like, no, it's online. I'm like, it's online? And I realized, holy cow, this thing's online. It's got like a million views. That's crazy. And people kept reaching out. And it was mainly women's conferences. And they were asking if I wanted to come and do like a breakout session. And they wanted me to just repeat that TEDx talk. And so I had no idea that this was an industry or a business. I looked at speaking as something that famous people do, something that sports people do, something that people that are major, major authors must do. So I didn't have a book. I didn't have anything. I just had my little secret five-second rule in my back pocket. I had a TEDx talk that had mistakenly gone viral online, and now I had people asking me if I would come and I would talk uh, in breakout sessions at women's conferences. And I'm like, okay, that sounds fun. Now, keep in mind in my life, uh, this is the moment when Chris has left the restaurant industry. He is bottomed out, not functioning, focused on getting sober, and I am working two jobs trying to keep things afloat. I mean, it is a really scrambling time in our life. And so I said yes to these things. And I'll never forget it. In 2013, I did seven talks, I think it was, all for free. I had no idea that people got paid to do this. And um, I was doing it because I wanted to escape <laughs> the pressure of my life. 
And if I'm being perfectly honest, as nervous as I was that about doing this, and I'd get a big neck rash, and I'd turn bright red in my face, as nervous as I was, there was something about being asked to tell my story and inspire other people that really lifted me up and made me feel, I don't know, like it's sort of like how you fluff a pillow up when it's looking deflated. It just lifted my spirits a little bit to, to have the focus be on helping other people. And so it was like a lifeline. But I was still so nervous. When I tell you I was nervous, I mean, I was so nervous. I not only wore Spanx, I would put like a pad in the Spanx because I was sweating so much. I had all kinds of wardrobe fails because I would, I would literally sweat like Niagara Falls. I, that's what I do. I have a hot flash as I get nervous. So um, I'll never forget it. It was um, the Pennsylvania Women's Conference. It was Hillary Clinton, I think, was the keynote speaker. And uh, then there was this incredible woman who was the principal of Strawberry Hill Mansion, who um, I just love. And she spoke in the main room, 14,000 women there. And I was in this breakout session. And it was the largest room I had ever been in. I almost had a heart attack. There were like a thousand seats set up. And I had never been in a room that size. So I give this talk, which was largely just a mimic of the, the, the TEDx talk that I did. And... This woman comes up to me afterwards and she's like, oh, my God, you were so great, you know, which was really nice to hear. And she said, can I ask you a question? You know, I I was also a speaker this morning. I was in a breakout room on a panel and I just want to ask you a question, speaker to speaker. And I was like, of course. And she said, did you get your check yet? And I said, check. Wait a minute. you, You got paid for this? And she looked at me with horror. And said, oh, my God, I'm really sorry. I just assumed, like, you had a bigger... I just assumed that you got paid. I'm like, people get paid for this? Like, people, like, normal people get paid for this? And I was so flabber. It was one of those moments where you're just like, am I the stupidest fucking idiot on the planet? Does everybody else know this shit but me? And I was so dumbfounded that for two weeks I was just, like, stunned at what an idiot I was. I didn't even think to ask anybody to pay me to do this. Because I didn't think I was any good at it. So um, I made myself a promise. I said, you know what? I have no idea what to charge. You don't have a book. You should probably write one of those too. But um, first got to figure out how to keep the lights on in the house and uh, keep the family afloat and keep paying the bills. And I thought, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to just, when the next person calls and says, we'd like to book you to speak, I'm going to pause, 54321, take a breath. And then I'm going to say, I think I'm available. What's your budget? And then I'm going to wait. I'm going to listen to the number. And then I'm going to go 54321. Pause. Normally I'm double. And pause and see what happens. Because I I didn't even know what to price myself at. So two weeks later, the phone rings. And it's this guy in Dallas, Darren Paul. And he had been in the speaking business for like 20 years. And he says... You know, blah, 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 heard the da, 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 da. And I got to thank his wife, Lori, because she's the one that saw my TEDx talk going viral on Facebook. And she said to her husband, you got to book this woman for our sales conference for Jay Hilburn. And so Darren calls me. First phone call I received, no joke, when I've made myself this promise. And he asked if I'm available five months from now in Dallas in August to speak at the national sales conference for this company, Jay Hilburn. I said... I think I'm available. What's your budget? And he said, $10,000. I dropped the fucking phone. We had liens on our 10,000. I, 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 had no, I had no fucking idea, people. What the f- 10,000 fucking dollars? Are you fucking kidding me? I will, I will literally, I'll strip for that. I mean, that's unbelievable. So I, I forgot the second part. I was like, okay, I'm in. I'm in. Yes, yes, yes. Now, luckily, I was so nervous. And, you know, sometimes fear is a fantastic thing because it motivates you. I was so nervous because I felt so unworthy of that amount of money that I did something really smart. And fear motivated me to do this. I was so nervous that I would fall flat on my face because I believed I was not worthy of that kind of money because I had never made that kind of money. That I used half of the budget to pay a graphic designer to help me create a PowerPoint because I needed at least something that would look like that. 
And I practiced and I practiced and I prepared. And that's one of the big things that you got to take away. One of the best freaking tools for nerves is preparation. The more you prepare, what you're actually doing is working through your own resistance to this shit. You're creating muscle memory. You're rehearsing. Will you choke? Maybe, but not after I teach you the tools that I'm going to teach you today. But you will never get better or conquer your fear of doing this, public speaking, if you're unwilling to prepare. So part of the nerves might be that you're not even preparing enough. You're not rehearsing. You're not rehearsing in front of people. You're not taking the time to edit your mark. Like it takes time and rehearsal is so important. If you prepare, you're removing nerves. You're setting yourself up to win. And so think about preparing like you're just building this muscle. It doesn't take the nerves away or the fear away or the stakes away, but by God, it's going to help these tools work because you will have the preparation. There's this really famous quote that I love uh, that I talk about all the time. It's by Charlie Bird Parker. I don't even know if this is a real story, but I love this quote. Apparently, Charlie Bird Parker, the famous jazz musician, was asked by a journalist who was writing a big article about him. How the hell do you do what you do with that horn? And you know what Charlie Bird Parker said? He said, well, first you got to learn your instrument. And that takes years, decades of practice. You got to study it. You got to rehearse. You got to do your scales. You got to practice over and over and over and over and over again until you learn that instrument. And then... You forget all that shit they taught you and you just wail. And so preparation allows you to tap into your genius. Preparation is what allows you to improv, to freestyle, to be fully expressed, the highest you, to channel, to like tap into something. And it's in there in you. That's why you feel this push-pull and this desire to show up more in your life. So I spent all this time preparing. And I showed up, and there are moments in your life that really matter, and this was one of them. I met this moment. I stepped on that stage with my neck rash and my rosy cheeks and my dry mouth, and I fucking destroyed it because I had prepared because I was afraid. Now... I also had the biggest wardrobe failure I have ever had on a stage. So I wore this dress because at the time I was a commentator for CNN and I used to wear this dress all the time on CNN. And I thought, okay, if somebody's paying you that kind of money, you got to look like you're on TV. So I wore this like kind of power lady dress. You can already imagine it, right? It's got like sort of the, the V-neck and the pencil skirt. And it's hard to walk in. It looks good on television, but you're not moving and you're sitting in a chair. I had never looked at it with a light behind me. And at the end of the speech, I just fillet this thing. I walk off that stage. It was the first time I'd ever been projected on a jumbotron in an arena. And after the speech, this woman came up to me. She was darling. She's like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I love the five-second rule. Thank you so much for those. It was amazing. I'm like, oh, my God. I'm going to pay my mortgage this month. This is great. And she said, you were so great. I have to tell you something. And I'm like, what? She said, don't ever wear that dress again. I said, why? She said, I don't even want to tell you this. I said, what? She said, I could not only see that you were wearing Spanx, but that you had a thong on underneath them. That dress is so th see-through and you could see it all on the Jumbotron. Okay. We went from winning to wanting to melt and crawl into a hole, but fuck it. You know, I honestly, when you fuck up, you know what? The research shows people like you more, and that shows in that comment. That, by the way, is called the pratfall effect, that your imperfections make you more likable, more trustworthy. It makes you as an expert be somebody that people lean toward. And you've had this experience, haven't you? Where you might have somebody that's got a PhD that's a know-it-all that's really snooty and talking down to you. You're kind of like, I don't want to learn from you. But when you got somebody that is, you know, on a stage or teaching you something or just somebody you meet 
if there's something that humanizes them, it so builds trust. And that's an important thing to understand because the idea here is not that you're going to get it perfect. It's that you're willing to try. So maybe that's why I destroyed it. I don't know. Everyone was rooting for me because you could see the spanks and the thong underneath the dress. But that dress went in the freaking trash can at the hotel, never to see the light of day again, although I hope somebody pulled it out and used it. Um, but I never looked back from that moment because Darren, who booked me, had been in this business for 20 years, and he said, I got to tell you, you are top three of all time and the single best female speaker I have ever seen in my entire life who manages your business. And I said, you do. And he has run my speaking business ever since. And so along the way, it took me several years to truly get over my nerves. And I don't get nervous. I care deeply. I get super intentional um, about the stakes because I really want to make a huge difference and I want to destroy it on these stages and entertain and empower and inspire and all of it. So I do care about how I perform when um, I am stepping on a stage or I'm behind this mic. But I have come up with incredible ways to not only face my fear of public speaking, but to conquer it and to use science and really amazing mental reframes to tame those nerves. And that's what I'm going to teach you today. Because you know what I want for you? I want your fullest expression. I want fear to stop holding you back. I want you to trust fall into your life. I want you to take that first step and climb the staircase to the things that you want in your life. And there are too many places where fear holds you back and keeps you silent and has you questioning yourself. And so that was me too. And I just chipped away at this fucker. And I am so glad that I did because I just can't even imagine how much I would yearn for what I'm doing now without even realizing it. But the first step is admitting that there are fears that are holding you back. And so we're going to use public speaking because it's the number one fear for everybody. I am here at the Dallas Convention Center and there are 3,000 chairs out there. And we have just run through the tech rehearsal. And I'm going to tell you a little secret about um, how I manage my uh, nerves and how I flip it into excitement. And this is something you can steal. There's always a reason why you are doing something. And when you can find the reason or the purpose for why you want to either give that speech or destroy the sales uh, presentation or walk into your boss and advocate for yourself because of the contributions that you're making, or you just want to find the courage to stand up in a town meeting and talk. There's always a reason why. And so before you're about to do it, one of the things that you want to do is you want to remind yourself of why this matters to you. I want to for example, at work, I want to be compensated and valued for my contributions, and it's my responsibility to make those contributions known. And so I'm going to be super proud of myself if and when I say this, or I want to make a difference in my town, and so I'm going to have to start speaking up because my voice needs to be heard. I don't want to be complaining about what's going on in this town in my own house. I want to be advocating for what changes I'd like to see make because I can make a difference. For me, whenever I give a speech, I always say the same thing to myself. I say that, yes, there are 3,000 seats here, but I'm only ever talking to one person. And I believe that there is one person in this audience today who is here because they are meant to be here. And there is something that I am about to say that will change their entire life. That they're going to learn something that might cure their anxiety or that might help them through a very, very, very dark moment to know that this is temporary. There is someone that's going to be inspired to make a major change. And I know that in the course of the hour that I am speaking on this stage, something is going to happen that is meant for that person. And if I trust that... It allows me to just ditch the script and show up as my full, highest expressed self. You know, look, it might be that I trip on the stage coming out. Not planned, but somebody in the audience seeing that, wow, if that woman on the stage trips and she gets back up, maybe I can stumble and get back up too. 
Look at how she just brushes it off and she doesn't care. What if I had that? I mean, it could be that. It could be something really profound like getting sober or leaving a really abusive marriage. So I remind myself of that and I'm only ever talking to one person. And that helps me. Uh, it helps me to stay focused and to know that what I'm about to do, even if it makes my stomach twist in knots, or even if I'm a little, quote, nervous about how it's going to go, it helps me stay aligned with my purpose. And that's where your pow power alley is always in life. And that's why it's so important for you to push yourself to express yourself and advocate for yourself and share your story. And so steal that idea. Remind yourself of why you're doing this. Only talk to one person and tell yourself that there is a person in this room and you are meant to say something in this room because somebody needs to hear you say it. And when you trust that, it's not about you. It's about the impact that you're about to make. Okay, um, we should get off the stage <laughs> because we got to go backstage and uh, get ready. I go on in about an hour. And this is normally the dead zone for people where they've practiced, they've run through something, and now they wait. And this is where your nerves can get the worst of you. So next up, after a short break for a word for our sponsors, I'm going to teach you the real trick uh, from Harvard Medical School to reframe all those nerves backstage or right before or in anticipation of into excitement so that you can align yourself with your mission and express yourself. Mwah. All right, five minutes before I take the stage, and um, here's the big trick. You know, we reframe fear into excitement. And the thing about nervousness is nervousness is just your body trying to get you into an alert state because what you're about to do requires you to concentrate. So, for example, you get nervous before a test because it's important and you have to concentrate and you care about the outcome. You get nervous before giving a presentation because you have to pay attention and the outcome's important. You get nervous before you have to uh, sing or go into an interview or go on a date because you're gonna be basically putting yourself out there and it's important and you care about the outcome and you gotta pay attention. That's what nerves are about. It's about getting you to get into an alert state. Same thing as excitement. Excitement is when your body goes into an alert state because something cool is about to happen and you gotta pay attention. And so right now, I literally say to myself, I'm not nervous. I'm really excited. I'm not nervous at all, in fact. I'm so excited to get out on that stage. Why? Because there is one person out there whose life is going to change. And as I get more and more uh, excited and get closer to walking up to that stage, my stomach will start to grumble. I will have to pee. Um, my armpits will sweat. My mouth is starting to get dry. But I keep telling myself, I'm not nervous. Those aren't butterflies. Those are the wings of possibility. Ooh, that's nice. That's deep, Mel. Uh, those are just me getting ready to do something that I care about. And I'm excited to get out there. And I'm excited to make a difference. And I'm excited to express myself. And I'm excited to push myself to do something like this. And so that's my little ritual. I don't dance around. I don't meditate. I don't get calm. I tap into excitement and I hijack the nerves and I label it something empowering. And that settles my body and it makes my focus get really laser focused on the impact I wanna make and that will help you perform. Okay, let me explain why your stomach has butterflies when you're nervous and why you have to pee and why your heart races and why your armpits sweat. This is all part of an, automat an automatic response in your body to either something that is exciting or something that is stressful. And when you roll back the clock in terms of evolution and you take a look at stress, we could spend hours and hours and hours talking about this, but I'm just gonna boil it down so that you have enough understanding to trust what I'm telling you about why reframing nerves into excitement works. This is from research at Harvard Medical School where they studied people in situations that made them nervous, job interviews, giving a speech, participating in a debate competition, singing, and running in a track meet. And they taught all of these people to tell themselves they were excited to do the thing that made them nervous, and it helped them perform better. And the reason why 
reframing stressful situations into excitement works is because um, there's no physiological difference in your body between a moment that's stressful and a moment that's exciting. Your body has the same alert response to it. All of the blood goes to your heart. It goes uh, to your brain. And that means it leaves your digestive tract. Because honestly, you don't need to be uh, digesting food if you're going to take a test. You don't need to be digesting food if you're going to sing on a stage. You don't need to be digesting food if you're going to give a speech. So the blood goes to your heart so that you can, you know, move. And it goes to your brain so you can think. And I'm dumbing this down. I realize there's a lot more complex science, but just the chemical structure, physiological structure changes. That's where the butterflies come in. See, the butterflies aren't there because you're nervous or excited. The butterflies are there because the blood flow increased to your heart, which is why your heart is racing. And the butterflies are due to that chemical change from the blood going to the heart and not being in the digestive tract. That's what that is, dude. That's also why you have to pee. Because you're not going to need to pee on stage. You're not going to need to pee while you're singing. And so your body has this natural response in exciting or stressful situations to dump what's ever in your bladder or in your bowels. Why? So that you can focus and so that you can run faster or perform better. That's why this happens. And so one of the mistakes that people make is that when they get nervous and they start getting butterflies, you think the butterflies are a sign that you're about to fuck up. No, it's a sign that your body's getting ready to do something. And you get to decide whether you call the thing you're about to do exciting or scary. And that's why the free framing works. Because there's no difference between you walking onto a stage and your heart racing and your armpit sweating and your throat being dry and your stomach being... Whoop, see, we are backstage. We're going to let the applause die down. And your stomach being in knots which is a situation that makes you nervous, or you going to a concert and your favorite brand, I can't wait to see Coldplay this fall. When they take that stage, let me tell you something, right before they come on, I'm gonna have to pee. There are gonna be pterodactyls in my stomach. My armpits are gonna be sweating. My heart's gonna be racing, but I'm excited because I said I'm excited. So reframing works. And here's the really important reason why this matters. Not only are you not going to freak yourself out by going, oh, my God, my stomach's in hot us really <laughs> which only increases how stressed you are, by the way. But by telling yourself you're excited, you stabilize yourself. Your thoughts don't race. And based on research from UCLA from Dr. Judith Willis, your stress response doesn't impact your brain functioning which means all that preparation of studying for the test or preparing for the speech or the presentation, you don't choke. You can tap into it. And so I think they're getting close. So I got to shortchange this science lesson right now. And I realize it's very elementary. But I want you to understand why you get butterflies. And it's not because you're about to fuck up. It's because you're about to do something that you can do and that matters. So go frickin' do it, which is what I'm going to do. We are talking about confidence. And I'm really excited because I'm going to walk you through the five simple tools that help you build this as a skill. And tool number one, take action. This is obvious. I understand. We have the definition of confidence. Confidence is the willingness to try. You're not going to change your life or build confidence by thinking about the things you need to do. You must take action. And so the best action to take, the number one tool for helping you take action in those moments where you feel imposter syndrome or you feel nervous or you're embarrassed or you start to doubt yourself or you feel anxious, whatever the feeling is, forget the feeling. Screw the feeling. We got to take action in those moments because remember, we're building confidence. It's going to require you to try. Just use my five-second rule. I told you the whole story about how I created it, the science behind it in the episode we released way back in the day called Motivation is Garbage. I'll link to that. But if you're brand new to the podcast, let me give you the shortcut. When you're in a situation where you start to doubt yourself, you're just going to count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, and then you physically move within five seconds. So here's how you can use it. Heather's talking about the fact that she wants to build confidence in this new role where she's been promoted. There are things that she needs to do as a new leader, but she doesn't have the competency yet. Instead of thinking about those things, she can use the five-second rule, five, four, three, two, one, to interrupt that self-doubt, 
which is right there in the interior part of your brain and your basal ganglia. It's a pattern to doubt yourself. And as you start counting backwards, five, four, three, two, one, your mind switches gears and your prefrontal cortex gets involved. And that's the part of the brain that controls your focus. It helps you interrupt thoughts and feelings of self-doubt. And it draws the part of your brain that will help you take action will help you engage in strategic thinking, will help you encode new behavior and habits. It will help you tap into your courage. That's it. That's all that it is for Alex, who is surrounded by all these high achievers. The next time she's sitting in a classroom and she has something that she wants to share, instead of shrinking in her seat, she's going to try. And the five-second rule is going to help. Five, four, three, two, one. And then she's going to shoot that hand up in the air because you know what? Alex has something to say. And even though she doesn't feel comfortable, even though she might get a neck rash, even though her cheeks might go fire engine red, and even though she might stutter or stumble or have dry mouth or whatever might happen, 54321, she is willing to try. Because here's something I want you to understand. You can tap into courage before you start having that feeling of assuredness. Courage is what you tap into. Confidence is what you're building over time. I'm going to say that again. Courage comes first. Courage, five, four, three, two, one. You start counting backwards, man, that is an act of courage because you're going for it. Courage comes first. Confidence is what builds over time. How cool is that, right? I absolutely love this because what I'm ultimately teaching you And this, again, relates to all the research, is that there's two types of people out there. There are people who think about what they want to do, and then there are people that find the courage to take action. And that's what I want for you, because you're not going to think your way out of fear or doubt or insecurity. You're not going to think your way through your fears and anxiety. The fact is, you have greatness inside you, and I want you to start tapping into it. It's only through action that you unlock that power inside you and you become the person that you're meant to be. I mean, that's how I, that's how I've created the life that I have now. If I didn't learn how to five, four, three, two, one, push myself to try, I'd still be sleeping in a bed, staring at the ceiling, consumed with anxiety, feeling like I had ruined my life. That's how you change your life. You have to take action over and over and over again. And so I think you get this. You get that you're not going to change or build confidence by thinking about doing this. Five, four, three, two, one, stop thinking and start taking some risks. Start trying. Put a bet on yourself. Let's freaking go. Now let's do rule number two. Rule number two is if you personally just tremble in your boots when you think about doing the things that you'd love to do. Let's get back to you. Let's get selfish. What is it that more confidence would have you be doing differently? When you think about those things, speaking up at work, launching your business, tackling your health issues, putting your online dating profile up and getting yourself back out there because you're ready and you've healed and the heartbreak is over and you're ready to have some fun again. When you start thinking about how confidence would change your life, I guarantee you, you're still going to feel a little nervous. So here's a second tool that's going to help you try. You can use the power of objectivity, okay? Let's make it less personal. Be the person you want to become or create an alter ego. This can be fun, you know? We don't have to like white knuckle this this confidence thing. Let's have some fun with it because there's a study out of Johns Hopkins that I love And it's about letting go of self-doubt. And the study suggests that when you use an alter ego or you create a vision of the future you, the person you want to become, it gives you distance from the scaredy cat you who's never done this thing before. So ask yourself, you know what I always ask myself? I go, well, what would The Rock do? In this situation, I just love Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. I constantly use him as my avatar when it comes to confidence. What would The Rock do in this moment? And I always get an answer, and it feels less personal because you and I are friends. You can use The Rock, you can use me. What would Mel do if you're feeling unsure and you want to tap into the confidence that you kind of pick up on for me? And this also taps into an entire body of research that I talk about a lot 
on the Mel Robbins podcast, which is behavioral activation therapy. Decades of research show that when you start acting like the person you want to become in the future now, in your present life, it's one of the fastest ways for you to change your mindset, for you to create new habits. Why? Because when you start acting like the person you want to become, In the future, you start acting like that person today, what are you doing? You're trying. (laughs) You're trying to act like the future you would act. So let's go back to our first question, Heather. When she acts like the Heather two years from now, who's now gotten another promotion because she just slayed it in this role, the Heather today is trying to be the Heather she wants to become. Isn't that cool? Alex sitting in the classroom surrounded by all these high achievers, when she acts like the Alex she wants to be two years from now, who's earned her doctorate, who is one of those high achievers, who is a bit more vocal, who is able to express her ideas, when she acts like that version of herself now, what is she doing? She's trying. How cool is this? It all just ladders right back to the research. That's why you can trust what I'm telling you. Another tool that you can use to build the skill of confidence is prepare. Because the more that you practice something, the more you're trying and the more competent you're going to be. So if you are nervous and you can't shake the nerves, double down on preparing. That's right. Do rehearsals. Run through it. Why? Because every time you rehearse something, you're trying it and it gives your mind and your nervous system the ability to lower the stress because your mind and your nervous system have prepared so you know what's coming. See, practice doesn't make perfect. Practice prepares you. And what's one other thing about practice? What's the first thing that you learned about confidence? Again, I come back to the definition. It's the willingness to try. That's how you put the definition into life, by practicing. Preparing for something, practicing something over and over and over, whether you're, you know, like uh, like the Williams sisters who literally stood there and hit balls 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 before they were even allowed to enter a tournament. What were they doing? They're building the skill of confidence. You want to be confident? Prove it by preparing. I use this all the time. You know, a lot of people, I laugh, like, you know, you you see me get in front of a a YouTube camera or you see me walk onto a stage or you listen to one of my audio books. You're like, how do you do that? I've prepared. (laughs) you know, Because when you're ready, I mean, just think back into your own life. Think about those moments in high school or college where you weren't prepared for the test. How nervous were you? You were shaking in your boots. You couldn't even concentrate. You knew walking into the test that you were screwed. Now think about a moment when you actually studied, which is just you practicing. You feel calmer, more assured. Why? Because you were willing to try by sitting in the stacks in the library instead of going out and cracking open the books. And that's what I'm talking about. This is something you build. Let me tell you about tool number four. I love this. This is a mindset reframe. Because you got the five-second rule, you've got the power of objectivity, what would Mel or The Rock do, you've got preparation, and now let me give you a mindset trick. I love this. I tell myself all the time why it's worth trying. The reason why I tell myself why it's worth trying, why is it worth trying something if I'm only going to fail? Why is it worth going for it if I can't make my dreams come true? I'll tell you why. Because everything that you do in life is preparing you for something that hasn't happened yet. What did I tell you about confidence? Confidence is not something you build when you're winning. I think oftentimes when we're winning, what gets built is arrogance and bravado. And we forget what went into winning at something in the first place. True confidence, the skill of confidence, it's forged in fire. I mean, I've failed more times than I have time to tell you. You guys know that a decade ago, talk about failure, 800 grand in debt, unemployed, drinking my way through my problems, and all of that heartbreak and headache and breakdown in my life, which was horrendous to go through, it led me to the five-second rule. If there was no debt, 
there was no drinking, there was no heartache, there would be no five-second rule. When I was a talk show host, I here I was taping a talk show at CBS Broadcast Center here in New York City. It was a dream of mine to be able to have a daytime talk show. It gets canceled. It was leading me somewhere. Where? To this podcast, which is my most favorite thing that I've ever done in my career. See, I choose not to stay in a place of self-doubt. I choose not to wallow in failure because I know that life is always preparing you for something. And I know that your greatest failures, your biggest heartbreaks, they always teach you the most important lessons in life. You know, and, and I keep getting questions from you guys. Mel, oh my God, you're so confident. Like what? You're 54 years old. You keep reinventing yourself. You keep trying new things like this podcast. What is it inside you, Mel? What is it inside me that makes me take all these risks, that makes me constantly try new things, that makes me willing to fail, to do something embarrassing or even disastrous? I'll tell you what it is. I want to get as much out of this life as I possibly can. And if you look at the math, I'm halfway through it. And it scares me to think that I could be on my deathbed and look back on my life and say, I wish I had tried that. I wish I had had the confidence to try that. I do not want to die and have regrets. And so while I'm here, while I'm breathing, while I'm able to, I am going to follow my curiosity. I am going to follow my heart. I am going to try new things. I am going to do absolutely everything that I can do to grow, to feel, to learn. And that's going to require me to take risks. That's going to require me to fuck up things. That's going to require me to look stupid. And I'm willing to do that because I know on the other side of the biggest heartbreaks of your life are the most amazing, heart-filled moments. I know that in the middle of every failure that I experience, and boy, I experience them oftentimes of my own doing, every single failure has, honest to God, equipped me with the lessons and the skill or the wisdom that I needed to be able to do something even cooler down the line. And I can prove it to you. Just, just look back on one of the scariest moments of your life, one of the biggest things that you just blew. I bet you can tell me that that horrible thing that happened, that really hard thing that in the moment you were like, why is this happening to me? That right now, no matter what your life looks like, you can sit here and you know exactly what you learned from it. You know that you would not be the person you are today had it not been for that thing that you experienced, that you survived, that you learned from. And so what drives me is just wanting to experience as much as I can from this one life that I have. And it's not all going to be a joyride. And so I'm willing to take the risk. I'm willing to try. I'm willing to look stupid. And I'm willing to do it because I think the payoff that you get, it's worth it. It's so worth it. So this moment, it's preparing me for something that hasn't happened yet. And that, free, that reframe, what it does is it helps me put failure and heartbreak and all the hard shit in life into a box that is something that stays by my side as I move forward instead of a wall or a block or an obstacle that stops me from continuing to move forward because that's how you move forward. You continue to try. And the final tool when it comes to building the skill of confidence is you have to focus on you because nobody's coming. Like nobody's going to try for you. Nobody is going to be there to motivate you to try. Nobody's going to be there to give you the pep talk. I'm here twice a week. I, I, it really is my mission that these episodes and our relationship through this podcast is one where you feel empowered and encouraged and you're reminded of who you are, that this is like a little reset, a pep talk, that you get the tools and the encouragement and the high five that you need. But ultimately, it's up to you. 
And you got to learn how to stop looking at the world around you and what everybody and their mother is doing. And you got to look right back in the mirror because you are the one person that you're going to spend your whole life with. And it's time that you start to focus on that person and getting into a better relationship with that person called you. Now I want to talk to you because you're an amazing person and you have the ability to impact so many people's lives. And I don't know if you realize just how powerful you are, that your energy, your love, your enthusiasm, being radically generous with it, it can change absolutely anybody's day. And when you change somebody's day in a positive way, that great day can become a great week. And that great week can roll into an amazing month. And that amazing month can turn into an incredible year. You just have no idea what somebody's dealing with. My friend Ed Millette, who is amazing, you should follow him. He's one of, one of my favorite people on the planet. He told me this story about how there is a person out in the world who was there when his father was struggling with alcoholism. And this stranger got his dad help. And Ed said, if it weren't for that stranger, Ed wouldn't be here. And that one act of kindness from one person can change somebody's entire life. And you have that power. And so I want you to think as you head into your day about the image of blowing bubbles. You know when a kid is blowing bubbles and the bubbles catch the sunlight and they float around and they fly away? It feels so good, doesn't it? It makes you smile. And you can stand there on a beautiful sunny day and blow bubbles and they drift off into space and who knows how far they go. Your energy is just like that. And you can spread good energy and you should. How do you do that? Be generous with the I love yous. Be super generous telling people I appreciate you. In fact, I have a habit every single day. I make it a habit to tell somebody that I appreciate them. And I do that by either reaching out to a friend and telling them that I miss them and I'm thinking about them. I have a friend who's going through uh, a really challenging moment right now with her dad. Hospice has been called in and I'm texting her every morning telling her that I'm sending her a hug and that she doesn't need to text me back, but I just want her to know that I'm here for her. I tell that to people that help me in the grocery store. I tell it to anybody, honestly, because we all need to hear it. Thank you for helping me. Thank you for being here. I love complimenting people's nails or their jewelry or their hairstyle or their socks and smiling, smiling. And don't forget your family. When somebody walks in the door, how do you greet them? Do you put a big smile on your face? Do you run to the door? Do you say, welcome home? Oh my God, I hope you had a great day. I always, always, always give our son Oakley the biggest hug and I hold it extra tight and I tell him I'm so happy to see him because every time you do this, you smile, you wave, you high five somebody, you give them a hug, you tell them that you love them, you text somebody out of the blue, you are a force for good. If you're staying in a hotel like I'm going to be tonight, leave a note for the person that's cleaning your room, a thank you, a smiley face, tell them you appreciate them. We all need to hear it. And when you become radically generous with your positive energy, with your compliments, with your enthusiasm, with your love, it spreads unbelievable waves of joy and positivity, lifting people up in ways that you'll never know. What are the top things that we can practice that help boost our influence and our likability when it comes to body language. Okay. Mm. All right. Confident and likable. Um, we have three power zones. Um, our neck dimple, I was going to back up and show you a little bit. So our neck dimple, it's our throat right here. Our, our neck belly dimple, button. is that the neck dimple like the little 
dip the, the dip yeah, in there for stitchel knot or whatever you, okay. whatever you say okay where you know your necklace lies right there so your neck dimple your, your neck your belly button and then your lower extremity i call it your naughty bits it's from the holy grail so uh your groin i was on the today show and i was gonna i was with a guy and they're sitting next to me ted from queer eye from the straight guy the original ted the original guy and he goes what are you talking about with al roker i said my neck dimple your belly button and your groin you keep it open when you're confident and likable he goes please never say the word groin on a morning show he said say the holy uh, say um naughty bits it's from the holy grail i loved it mel as you might imagine and i went on there i loved it and i said neck dimple belly button and groin why but i love naughty bits because we need to practice. We need to practice, practice, practice. What you're learning today, you got to practice. Say today, I'm going to pay attention to belly buttons. So keep our neck dimple, our belly button, and our naughty bits open. Now let's talk about the belly button. I call this naval intelligence. We face our belly button towards people we like, admire, and trust. So if I'm flirting with Brad Pitt, but my belly button is facing George Clooney, everyone thinks I'm flirting with Brad. I want to hook up with Brad, but really my belly button wants to go home with good old George. In a meeting, count up how many belly buttons are facing you. If you have 50% of the belly buttons facing someone else, then that person is probably your arch nemesis. And if I were to give you a tip, emotional intelligence is being smarter. I would make sure I have meetings with that person first to get them on my side before going into that other meeting because 50% of the ears are listening to that person. On a date, pay attention if the date is over. I'm a talker, right? So. Are you like talking past the sale, even in, a, in an intimate thing, like on a date, right? Pay attention. That belly button is angled towards the door to the car they want out. I call it naval intelligence. And it's our first connection to another human being. Our belly button was connected oh, to the true. umbilical cord. So the belly button rule, I call it. So keep the three power zones open. Watch your pacifiers, those high level pacifiers. If you're nervous and it happens, first of all, give yourself a positive trait, right? Plant that seed, that belief. And then if you need to pacify, do toe push-ups inside your shoe. So you're up there, never tell us you're nervous. Never say, oh, I'm not good at public speaking. I'm really nervous. I'm not good. Never do that. Because when you're nervous, we see it. And mirror neurons make us nervous and love you even more. As soon as you disclaim it and like, oh, I'm nervous. I've never done this before. We're like, ah, she figured it out. Don't let us in. Like, we are already seeing your body language. We're cheering you on. We love you so much. So instead right here do toe push-ups one and two and three inside your shoes we're not what does that them. do it's getting out that stress and anxiety wow instead of doing this instead of benching your foot instead of doing this just get that stress and anxiety when you move your body you move your mind that's why exercise decreases stress in law enforcement we get more inf confessions walking from the jail cell back to the interrogation room or the interrogation room to the police car than we do in the interrogation room when you move your body, you move your mind. So sometimes we just gotta get people moving. I like to say, if you're stressed, some people are anxious, right? So you, you have anxiety. By the way, if you are the type of person that you have anxiety and you say, but what if this happens? But what if that happens? We need to plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? You're kind of gloom and doomy and everyone lets you know it. Would you like to know what your superpower is? Yes, you can see around corners. Their superpower is they can lean back into the past bring the past mistakes and past wins into the future, into now, and lean into the future and use that future now. They're trend spotters. They set goals, they measure progress, they update plans. Wow. These are the people, every weakness that we have, you're lazy, you don't finish projects, 80% you finish, it's connected to body language. You don't finish projects, like my ex-husband, that's his cute nickname I called him, lazy, right? <laughs> he would, I call him the 80% man, he'd paint a room and leave it 20% undone. And How long were you married? Covered. 20 years I was with him, but we get along great. He's one of my best friends, I think, by the grace of God. 20 long years. It's like SpongeBob, 20 years later. But his, know what his superpower was? No. A lazy person who doesn't finish work? Flexibility. When's the last time you thanked people for their flexibility? We spend every Christmas in Boston, he's from California, every Halloween, every Easter, every Thanksgiving. When we go to movies, I picked the movie. When we're making dinner, I picked the dinner. I never thanked him for his flexibility, but I made fun of his laziness until I discovered, this is my next TED Talk, so you're getting a sneak peek, that all of our decision-making weaknesses have corresponding superpowers. So if you have people that don't finish projects in your life, 
I bet you they're the most flexible people in your life and you may want to thank them and say, I didn't realize you have a superpower flexibility and I want to honor that and thank you for being so flexible. All right. So Cameron, I'm really excited. I'm going to teach you how to create and use what I call a confidence anchor. Not only when you're about to fly and you're nervous, but for any single situation where you're nervous to do something. Okay. Are you ready? Yep. Awesome. It's super cool. And for you listening, I want you to just hold that situation that you're nervous about. So maybe you're nervous to give a presentation at work, or maybe you have a son or a daughter who is getting recruited for a sport, and now there's all these big team matches coming up, and they're starting to get nervous. This confidence anchor is exactly what you need. So step number one is you're going to think about this situation that makes you nervous, okay? And we've already talked about that, Cameron. It's this flight to Portugal. Step number two is come up with something about this situation that actually makes you excited. So describe for me, Cameron, what are you excited to do when you get to Portugal? I think the thing that I'm most excited for is to see my sister. I haven't seen her in a couple months. She's been in London. So I don't know. I When it when I think about Portugal, there's a lot of things I'm excited for, but probably the biggest thing is just to spend time with her. And I love it. yeah, that's perfect. Okay, great. So you now have something related to the situation that makes you nervous that you're actually excited about. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. number three is the most important part. Number three is now that you have something that you're excited about. I want you to close your eyes and we're going to bring it to life. I want you to imagine the moment that you lay eyes on your sister for the <laughs> first time in several months. And I'm imagining, are you imagining the airport or a cobblestone street? Like what is the scene? Describe with your eyes closed. What is she wearing? What happens? Mm -hmm. Describe it for us. Well, first of all, she's probably, I don't know. She's probably mad that we're late about something. But uh, <laughs> when I think about it, we're, yeah, we're in probably like Lisbon where we're going to land and probably right outside, you know, the first glance of a new city, something that is always really exciting when you leave an airport. I think that's the best part about flying is getting to somewhere you're, you know, anticipating seeing. Um, so I picture that. I picture her standing there, probably like in some black sweater, because that's usually what she's wearing. And yeah, her, I think seeing her face reacting to my mom me and my brother that's going to be like the best part because I know she even if she won't admit it she does miss us a lot so awesome and who is she gonna hug first a hundred percent my mom okay awesome and how amazing. I'll probably be last <laughs> okay. and as you stand there and watch her in her black sweater with Lisbon in the background hugging your mom what are uh -huh. you feeling like a sense of comfort a sense of wholeness and yeah, just a really good feeling to have us all together during like a really hard time of the year. It's gonna, it's gonna be really special. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that's your confidence anchor. That moment that you just described in detail, the black sweater, Lisbon in the background, her reaction as she sees you, her hugging your mother first, the wholeness, the comfort, all of that that you just felt in your body, that is your confidence anchor. Now, here's how you're going to use it. From now until that moment happens, the millisecond that you feel any nerves or any fear or any negative thought come up related to this thought, you're going to mm -hmm. close your eyes you can use my five second rule to interrupt the worries. Just count backwards with me. Five, four, 
Four. Three. Three. Two. Two. <laughs> one. one. Yep. That is a starting ritual that will signal to your brain that you're not going to think about a plane crash. You are starting to think about something else. And then you are going mm -hmm. to bring to the forefront of your mind that image, that feeling that you just described. And that is how you drop a confidence anchor on these bullshit nerves and worries that have been hijacking your life. That's what a confidence anchor is. You're using your own excitement about something that normally makes you nervous to shatter the grip that fear and nerves has on your body and your mind. That's what you're going to do. And when you head to the airport on the way to the plane, you are going to use this same confidence anchor. And when you get on that plane and your thoughts go, uh-oh, you're going to go, nope, five, four, three, two, one, and you're going to drop that confidence anchor. And when you take off in the middle of the night and the pilot says, we might experience a little bit of turbulence because pilots often say that, you're going to drop that confidence anchor and you're going to come back over and over and over again to this image of your sister and the black sweater and Lisbon behind her and her hugging your mother. That's exactly what you're going to do. And you're going to be shocked because this is a technique that they studied at Harvard Business School called reframing performance anxiety was the name of the study, reframing performance anxiety. And it's a way to flip moments that make you nervous into moments that make you excited and to keep control of your mind, body, and spirit so that your fears don't hijack and torture you. Wow. <laughs> what do you think? I mean, it makes sense because I think in the moments of panic, the last thing I'm doing is thinking about anything that brings me happiness. It's always the darkest feelings, the heaviest emotions versus, you know, even just closing my eyes just now. I feel so different, like sitting here, I feel like even thinking about that moment makes me happy and I'm excited to use it because I know I'm going to be anxious all next week, week after. So you want to know why this works? I do. Okay. seems too good to be true. Honestly, it seems too good to be true. Well, the reason why it works is because it taps into your body's automatic systems. If you look into the neuroscience on this, scientists call this an autonomic response, that basically your nervous system has a autonomic response to stressful situations, okay? That, like if you're a normal person like me, you just say, oh yeah, we, if we're in a stressful situation, we automatically feel all kinds of things, right? And so what I want mm -hmm. you to understand is that, you know, when we're in situations that make us nervous, everybody whether you're giving a speech or you're going into an interview or you're on a first date or you're running a track meet or you're getting on a plane or you're breaking up with somebody or you're going in for a job interview, it is going to be automatic that your nerves take over because you're about to do something that makes you stressed out a little bit. It's requiring you to feel, it makes you feel a little bit vulnerable. But here's the cool thing. Even though you have this automatic response, because you're right, there's no way over the next five weeks you're not going to feel anxious because that's the autonomic response that your body has to this stressful thing. But here's the cool thing, Cameron, you can control this. So here's, here's the secret. The secret is understanding that your body's reactions to fear, so your automatic reaction to a fearful situation, is the exact same as your body's automatic response to an exciting situation. And we're going to use this truth that your body's automatic reaction to fear is the same as your body's automatic reaction to excitement to your advantage. So tell me about a situation that makes you excited, like just something like in your day-to-day -day life, okay? Give me a situation that makes you excited. In my day-to-day -day life, that makes me excited. Uh, well, how about this? Who's your favorite musician? Uh, 
I really like the Lumineers. Okay, great. Guess what? Mm -hmm. The Lumineers are playing a private concert at the new private venue at the Fenway Park. You, my friend, not only have front row seats, you're going to meet them before the show. Okay. It's five weeks out. How do you feel? Jittery a little bit. Um, Like kind of the same feeling I would have if I, you know, was playing a big soccer game or running an important race Uh when I was younger, like the clammy hands, the pit in your stomach. Yep. The Dude, like, we're walking into this venue. You're walking up yeah, to the front like, row. How you feeling? My heart's beating fast. I'm like going a million miles an hour. I don't know. Probably feeling like really on edge. Yeah. The usher is coming up to be like, okay, they're ready to meet you. How you feeling? <laughs> I'd be like, okay, okay. Like, let me collect myself. <laughs> Yeah, probably really flustered and uh, I don't know, like a little bit anxious probably. So it kind of sounds like a situation like that where you're about to meet your favorite band, which I would say, is that a positive or a negative experience? Yeah, that'd be amazing. I mean, a positive one, obviously. Well, it sounds very similar to the way that you experience the thought of flying to Portugal. Yeah, <laughs> I guess that's true. Yeah, you want to know the only difference? When you're in the situation that's positive, that makes you excited and you're about to meet the Lumineers, your mm-hmm. brain is telling you you're excited. Your brain is telling you the jitters in your stomach are butterflies. And that's a good thing. Your brain is telling you your hands are clammy and your heart is racing because something good's about to happen. The only difference between that And what you experience as you think about flying to Portugal is what your brain is saying about the flight. When you start to experience butterflies in your stomach as you are about to board the flight, your brain's going, "Uh uh-oh, there's something wrong. This is negative. I'm going to, the plane's going to crash. You're experiencing in your body, Cameron, the exact same physical and physiological symptoms when you meet the Lumineers as when you board a plane. And the only difference is what your brain is saying about it. And so the reason why a confidence anchor works is we are going to shut your negative brain down and drop this confidence anchor right on it like a sledgehammer. And we're going to replace <laughs> your narrative that something's wrong with, holy shit, I'm about to see my sister. This is so exciting. It's as exciting as meeting the Lumineers. And when your brain starts to say the butterflies are positive, you won't escalate into a panic attack. You will have taken control. How cool is that? That's pretty cool. So do you have any questions about the confidence anchor and how you're going to use it? It just honestly seems still a little bit too good to be true. Like, I don't know. I can just conquer all my fears just by flipping the way I'm thinking. There's a scientific reason why this works. So they researched this at Harvard Business School. And what they did is they put people in control groups and put them in situations that made them nervous. So they put uh, one group into a control group where they had to run a track meet. Another one had to sing karaoke. Another one was in like a debating competition. And they taught one group of people to use this reframing tool where you think about something related to the track meet or the debating competition or karaoke that you're excited about. And so this group was taught to say, I'm excited. I'm excited to run this meet. I'm excited to get up there on the stage and conquer my fears. I'm excited to, to go and debate because I've prepared. The people who use this simple reframing tool outperformed the people who didn't. They felt less nervous and there's a scientific reason why. Earlier, we talked about the fact that there are these auto, automatic responses that our body has to situations that are exciting or stressful. And in our case, Cameron, we talked about the Lumineers and how that's exciting, meeting the Lumineers, and getting on a plane to Portugal, which used to make you nervous. Just talking about those two situations created an automatic response in your body, didn't it? Yep. That automatic response is nothing more than a series of chemicals firing and messages firing between your brain and your nervous system. 
The reason why you and I get butterflies is because when the brain sends a message down to your nervous system that, holy cow, we got to get on a plane, or holy cow, the Lumineers are about to walk in, your mm -hmm. nervous system goes, oh, got it, and immediately starts changing up the chemicals in your body. Adrenaline fires. The blood races to your head and to your heart. That's why your heart starts pounding. That's why your thoughts start to race. Now you get butterflies because the signal in your brain going to your gut just changed the chemicals in your digestive tract. That's why we all get butterflies. That's it. And so in the situation with the Lumineers, you flipped your thoughts. I'm excited to meet them. And so that explains all the reasons why you have all the, these changes going on in your body, why your heart is racing, why your butterflies are in your stomach. This automatic response doesn't scare you because you're thinking positive thoughts when it comes to the lumineers. Now, when you get on the mm -hmm. plane and your brain signals to your stomach that something's up and your heart starts to race because the blood goes to your heart, and the butterflies start to flutter in your stomach because the chemical structure just changed in your digestive tract. If you have negative thoughts about the plane, a couple things happen. You start to get scared of the automatic response in your body. And more cortisol starts to flood your brain, which is the stress hormone. And once that happens, what they found at the Harvard Business School study, is that the cortisol interferes with your brain's ability to do whatever you had prepared to do. This is why most of us, when we stand on a stage, go blank. It's because we have an automatic response. Our brain goes, oh shit. We get scared of our racing heart because we think it means that the plane's about to crash or we're about to screw something up. The cortisol floods our brain and we forget what we prepared. When the cortisol floods your brain, you forget about seeing your sister. You forget about all the exciting things. You forget about all the research that you did that shows that traveling by commercial airplane is the safest way to travel, period. Mm -hmm. That's why this matters. And it's more than just thinking positive thoughts. It's critical that you come up with the thing you're excited about before you get into the situation. Because once your thoughts start to race and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to screw up this test or oh my God, I'm going to screw up this interview or oh no, the plane, you've already lost control. You have to come up with this exciting anchor and this confidence anchor before you start to get nervous. Got it? Yeah. Any other questions? <clears throat> it just makes so much sense. You know, I always have taking the approach of calm down cam like you know kind of making myself to be the bad guy um and not really reframing it in any way just letting myself kind of soak in all the stress and anxiety <laughs> uh and just kind of reprimand myself being like what the heck you know why are you why are you not just calming down like there's a six-year-old that's you know bouncing and around and it's like oh I love when the plane goes up and down and it's like why can't I be like that six-year-old but uh, let me yeah, tell you why I think this I is get... excellent Cameron let me tell you why you can't bite <laughs> okay. by that six-year-old because I love this analogy the six-year-old's brain is not attaching negative thoughts to the plane bouncing up and down as far mm -hmm. as the six-year-old is concerned this is exciting that's why they're not panicking and so yeah. the reason why in the history of telling yourself to calm down, you have never been able to calm down is because you are dealing with an automatic response in your body. So let's go back to the science. When you get into a situation that makes you nervous or that makes you stressed out or makes you afraid or that makes you excited, those are states in your body of high agitation. Those are states of alertness. Those are states when your blood starts pumping and your brain starts paying attention and, you know, everything kind of aligns because you're about to do something that makes you excited or fun or nervous or afraid. And so you go into a state of being hyper alert. 
that state of high agitation is one that you can't calm down like that. So what mm -hmm. we're doing when we teach you to create a confidence anchor and to use excitement to reframe what you're feeling is we're taking a state of high, ag high agitation from the negative to a state of high agitation in the positive. We're actually using the automatic response in our body to, the, to our advantage. And we're just tricking our brain to believe that we're actually excited because our brain doesn't know the difference. Your brain is like the six-year-old. Your brain actually doesn't know the difference between excitement and fear. That baby that's bouncing is feeling the heart racing and the, the, the bubbles in her stomach. It's just that your brain is framing it in the negative. Because your brain knows that excitement and that fear feels the same, that lumineers, that meeting the lumineers and being on an airplane feels the same, you can use that to your advantage and trick your brain in a moment where you would normally be nervous to actually think you're excited. And the reason why this matters, Cameron, is because when you're on that plane, if you can come back over and over and over to your confidence anchor, and if you can close your eyes in a moment of turbulence, and you can imagine your sister, and you can start to say out loud, and this is important, you've got to say to yourself, I'm so excited to see, what's your sister's name? Sienna. I am so excited to see Sienna. I'm so excited to see Sienna. I cannot wait for Sienna to hug my mom. I cannot wait for this. If you come back to that confidence anchor, you are going to flip your brain into believing that you're excited about that moment and you will no longer be afraid. And it's a way to gain control. And you know what? You want to know something really cool? Because your confidence anchor is related to what you're doing, it's really believable. Mm -hmm. Because when you are there hugging your sister, it means the plane made it and there's nothing to be worried yeah. about. That's why this works. When you imagine before a test yourself walking out of there going, yes, it actually makes you excited to take it. When you imagine yourself nailing the interview, it makes you excited to walk into it because your brain doesn't know the difference between a state a fear or a state of excitement. And now you know a simple trick backed by research from Harvard to take control of your mind and take control in situations where nerves normally derail you. Yeah, that's amazing. I think that was always like in the back of my head during our conversation was if I'm still I feel fear in a lot of different areas of my life, not mm -hmm. when I'm just in the air. Mm -hmm. So when I'm on the ground, how can I use this tool to ground myself, even I, if I'm not sure the outcome of it? I love this. Okay, great question. I want you to take out a notebook and you're going to write down any okay. single thing that makes you nervous. Could be anything. I mean, what? Give me a couple. Oh There's a long list, probably, but uh, off the top of my head, like something that I don't know. I really wish that I could beat the fear on is I recently moved, um, not that far, but there's a really nice yoga studio on my street that I like pass every day. And I just always think like, I need to be a part of a community of 20 somethings that are like-minded that, you know, I just, I've always loved yoga. I've loved the community it brings, um, but I cannot bring myself to sign up and I can't bring myself up. Like I just constantly think about the day I have to show up for my first class and it makes me way too anxious to even like go. This is an excellent example. And by the way, incredibly common and very relatable. Yeah. So I'm really glad you shared it. So you're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to create a confidence anchor because what I hear is I hear you want to do it. I hear mm -hmm. it pulling you and the nerves are keeping you back. So name 
the name something you're excited about. So like, can you pick like a coffee shop in your neighborhood that you love to go to and it's going to be your treat to get a nice latte when you're done? Yep. Do you want me to name it? Yeah, I do. It's called Thinking Cup. I love Thinking Cup. Now (laughs) you're going to close your eyes. What color yoga tights are you wearing? Oh God. Maybe like, I have this really nice light blue ones that I always like to wear. I love it. And as a treat, because you went to this relaxing yoga class in your light blue tights, sweatshirt tied around your waist, yoga bag over your shoulder, standing at Thinking Cup. What did you order? Um, Probably like an iced oat milk latte. Love it. <laughs> Love it. How do you feel? Yeah. As you're walking out of the Thinking Cup, having just completed that class and treating yourself to that. How do you feel right now? Like proud of myself for doing it. Awesome. There's your confidence anchor. Anytime you feel nervous, you're going to count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, to interrupt the nerves and create that starting ritual. And you're going to drop that confidence anchor. And what's going to happen is it's going to slowly retrain your mind that you're not nervous about joining that yoga studio. You're actually excited. And when you start to practice this confidence anchor, at some point you're going to find yourself walking down the street and there's the studio. And as that wave, because remember, it's automatic. That automatic response comes up because you're about to do something new. You get to choose whether your brain says no or yes. And using the confidence anchor in this research from Harvard in the five-second rule, you can flip that moment from one of stress to one that's something awesome because you have the power to make your brain say yes. I'm excited to do that and I'm going to walk in today And I'm going to sign up for that relaxing yoga class. And I am going to imagine how great I'm going to feel in my hot, amazing light blue yoga tights as I sip (laughs) that oak milk latte and walk out of thinking cup as my reward for getting it done. And that, my friend, is how you use science to conquer your fears and create the life that you love. And I have a feeling, Cameron, and... I have a feeling for you listening to us too, that this little technique is not only going to help you tee up and knock off one thing after another that you're afraid to do or nervous to do, whether it's jumping on a plane or walking into a yoga studio or asking somebody out or working on your side hustle. I think what it's actually going to do is not only get you in action, I think it's going to help you reprogram your mind because I don't think you realize, Cameron, how much feeling on edge and nervous is a default for you and how much it's actually holding you back and robbing you of the happiness you deserve. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe.